The following program is a Family Life Today classic. All of us as parents will do whatever we need to do to help our children grow up walking in the truth, walking in faith. Author and researcher David Kinneman says, there is no recipe for success. What we learn over and over and over is that faith isn't a formula. Uh, it is being led as parents by the Holy Spirit. We did learn some practices, but you can't boil faith down to a simple set of do this twice a week and these conversations and you know everything's gonna turn out right. In fact, every story is unique. Every heart, every soul is unique. And I think we have to honor that first and foremost is that each, each young person, uh, God's speaking into their hearts and, and sometimes their hearts become hardened for reasons that we can't control and we, sh we shouldn't try to control those. Welcome to Family Life Today, where we want to help you pursue the relationships that matter most. I'm Ann Wilson. And I'm Dave Wilson. And you can find us at FamilyLifeToday.com or on our Family Life app. This is Family Life Today. And welcome to Family Life Today. Thanks for joining us. I've shared this before, but I just, I feel like it needs to be said over and over again. Third John 4 says, I have no greater joy than to know that my children are walking in the truth. Now, John is talking about his spiritual children when he writes that, but if that's the case for spiritual children, how much more for our biological children? No greater joy for a parent than to know that your kids are walking in the truth. Why do you think that brings us so much joy? Because we know that that's where life is mm -hmm. and where hope is. I've asked parents, if you could imagine that your child is 30 years old and they write a letter home and they say, the job's doing great, I'm making good money, all of this going on, we're not going to church anymore, but you know, we were able to take the vacation and have this and the kids have got all of this stuff and, and we're happy and life's good. You get that letter from one child. The other child writes home and says, it's been a rough month. We were barely able to make the, the bills. But you know what? God's got us, and we're, we're hanging in. Which child are you going to feel happier about? And it's because we know that second kid is where God's got him. The first kid is dealing with his own success and self-reliance, and that's not going to take him anywhere. Living for temporal versus eternal. <laughs> and yeah. if there is no greater joy than to know your children are walking in the truth, then there's probably no greater fear or pain for a parent mm -hmm. than to imagine that your child would not be mm -hmm. at some point walking in in the faith. And we've got a couple of guys joining us this week to help us understand the culture in which we live, the pressures on our kids, our young adult kids, as they enter into what you guys refer to as the digital Babylon. David Kinneman and Mark Matlock are joining us again. Guys, welcome back. It's a pleasure. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having us. David and Mark have written a book called Faith for Exiles, Five Ways for a New Generation to Follow Jesus in Digital Babylon. David, who is joining us remotely from Southern California from the offices of the Barna Group, gives leadership to the Barna Group, which has been doing research in the, in the Christian world, the Christian space, for decades. Mark is a pastor, a church leader, worked with youth for years in his local church. He's a researcher as well. We've talked about the realities of the culture in which our kids are living, about the screens and the influence of being discipled by your screen instead of discipled by your by your father or your youth pastor or the Christian community. We've talked about the fact that some kids uh, end up as prodigals. Some kids end up as vaguely spiritual nomads, not going to church, but still hanging on to some spiritual vestige. A lot of kids wind up as what you call habituals who are going to church and going through the motions, but we really wonder how tethered to the faith they are. And then there's this 10%, this one in 10 who are resilient and their faith is alive and they're on fire and they're excited and they want to tell other people about Jesus and they really believe it. And every parent is saying, what's the recipe for that? Okay. What are the ingredients I pour in? What's the temperature I bake it at? Because I want to make sure all of my kids are that. Well, one of the things to keep in mind is that it's it's it, we wish it were that easy right. uh, to find the right temperature, the right ingredients, the right combination. 
but what we learn over and over and over is that faith isn't a formula. Uh, it is being led as parents by the Holy Spirit. We did learn some practices, and we'll tell you about those, but the first principle that we we've really seen in this is that you can't boil a faith down to a simple set of do this twice a week and these conversations and you know everything's going to turn out right in fact that's part of the premise of our research over the last decade or more wrote a book called unchristian another book called you lost me that were really about the problems and obstacles so i've spent a a bunch of years you know hundreds of thousands of, of interviews with young people who have walked away from faith or who are growing in faith and so faith is, is not a formula. Every story is unique. Every heart, every soul is unique. And I think we have to honor that first and foremost is that each, each young person, uh, God's speaking into their hearts and, and sometimes their hearts become hardened for reasons that we can't control and we, sh- we shouldn't try to control those. Mm. If you are a church leader or a youth worker, I want to encourage you that this 38% that are the habituals that we talk about, we really want to focus these practices on them. Mm -hmm. They're really the opportunity that we have. We spend a lot of energy worrying about those that are already walking away. We have a real opportunity that are coming into our programs that are welcoming us in right now, those are the groups that we need to really be looking at with these five practices. So let me explain the background behind the research first, and uh, then I'll have Mark describe these five practices. But uh, as I've said, we've been studying all the disconnections among young people, the reason that young people walk away from faith for a long time. Uh, But we really want to understand what helps connect these 10% who are most resilient. So again, we put people in different buckets. We analyzed the data. We interviewed nearly 1,500 individuals across those four groups that we've been talking about this week. What we did was we really wanted to isolate what are the practices that make a difference with those resilient disciples. And so these aren't formulas, but they are guidelines and guardrails for us as parents to pursue. All right. So what are they, Mark? Okay. And we're going to give these to you in a very high, high level way. So it's important to understand the context for that, right. right? That these are big ideas, but it's the detail underneath them that is really where you start seeing the work. Okay, parents, get ready. Okay. So the first thing is experiencing Jesus. This idea that I'm clearing away the clutter, the religious clutter that exists in the world today and in the church to really meet with Christ. Meaningful relationships. I'm around people that I enjoy being with and I aspire to become. Hmm. Cultural discernment. This idea that I can apply the word of God to the world around me and navigate it, make sense of it. Vocational discipleship. This idea that my work is a part of the way I express my faith and live it out. And then countercultural mission, this idea that I know that I, as a Christian, I'm going to be living counter to the ways of this world. And that sometimes in calls, calls me to take epic moments of trust where I trust in God rather than the conventions of this world for the good around me. Boy, that, that list of five is powerful. And your book, Faith for Exiles, is that's the heart of the book, is to talk about these five things. Go back to the first one, the experiencing Jesus. Are we talking about a phenomenological experience? Are we talking about there needs to be a, a, a spirit in the room that we're aware of? Or what, what does the experience of Jesus mean? Yeah, so, you know, one of the interesting things that we did, and it's one of the first things I did when I got the raw data back, is as I was looking through, I wanted to find out what is the age that these different groups are saying that they consciously became a Christian. Mm. So, you know, that moment that they knew they were a Christian. And what's really interesting is that resilience uh, marked that age a little bit later in their childhood (laughs) than the prodigals and the nomads uh, by about six years. What's going on? Because when I read that in your book, that jumped off the page. Yes. It did. It did. It's not what you hear. It's it's not the younger what, the better. The younger the better. And you know, obviously and I'm I gave my life to Christ just before the age of five and it stuck. So there's no reason to to doubt younger conversions. But I think we need to allow God to work in the lives of our children and not try to force something to happen. Because what we can see here is that we can actually socialize our kids to Christianity rather than actually helping them experience Jesus. And that's where I think if you notice these five factors working together, just as you said, Bob, that uh, if a person has an experience of Jesus, but they don't have the mind of cultural discernment or they don't work out their faith through vocational discipleship or it's not alive in their relationships or it's not sacrificial in terms of countercultural mission. Uh, these five things really work 
well together. They have to work together. Uh, our life with Christ and, and our relationship upwards, our relationship with others, our relationship of our heart and our mind and our, and our work of our hands, and then our work in the world. So all five of these areas, what we find is that people that are deficient in more than all five of them are deficient in their faith. And it's, it's not a, a test that we give them, but that if our faith in Christ doesn't work itself out in how we relate to others, how we think about the world, how we think about our work, how we think about our mission, uh, then it's not, it's not the kind of Christianity that anyone wants to follow. And I think that's what many young people are rejecting is these sort of half-hearted, one-dimensional forms of faith. I, yeah, I followed Jesus. I gave my life to him, but, but nothing else really changed. Nothing right. else was really asked of me by the church. Well, our kids prayed prayers when they were little. Mm -hmm. And um, we were talking about baptizing them because they said, we'd like to get baptized. But Dave was like, you know, let's just disciple them and wait until as they get baptized, like, this is meaningful. Like, we want to do this. This is our own faith. This isn't our parents. This is us. And at first I was like, what? You know, this isn't good. No, she was all over me. <laughs> <laughs> let's go. Let's get them baptized. They showed some interest. And again, I was like, let's let it be their decision. And then it didn't happen for years and years. And then they go to Israel or somewhere and come back and say, we got baptized, which was great. I think what you've just modeled there and described is a very, the healthy, but the right kind of tension for parents to have, or, uh, you, you know, if you're in a, a single parent home, the sense that you're trying to like push your kids into the category of being Christian. And that's the thing we're learning so much with this generation. Uh, a lot of research that we're now seeing is that they don't want to be emotionally manipulated. In fact, one of the things that's really heartbreaking for me as a researcher is to hear the stories of young people who say, yeah, I made this like weird commitment at a camp or in a, in an environment. And I just, I feel like as I look back now, mm. five years ago or 10 years ago is that they set these conditions in which my heart was going to be, you know, manipulated towards a certain decision. And so we, we have to be really careful. Like this is a lifetime decision. So I really applaud you guys for working that out uh, in your, in your relationship with your kids. And even though it's hard for us as parents because we want to, like, tip the kids into the Christian camp. Out of uh, fear sometimes. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Out of fear. And yeah. how many of us have heard somebody share their testimony as an adult and they would say, well, I prayed a prayer when I was six, but. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then they go on to talk about a time later in life when their faith really became alive for them and what was going on spiritually. And, you know, if they had died from one point to the other, what's the truth? I won't get into that because I don't know the, the mind of God. Only God knows the heart of a child. But I do know that what we want is we want there to be an alive faith in a child. I remember a guest on Family Life Today who said the same five-year-old who says, I want to ask Jesus in my heart, says, and when I grow up, I want to be a dinosaur. Right. And as a five year old, you're, that's how you're thinking. Now, it could be, as it was for you, Mark, a genuine profession. One of our kids prayed at, at the age of four and walked with Jesus the rest of her life. Right. So we've seen that happen. For sure. But there are a lot of kids who pray the prayer at four. And when they're in junior high, they're not sure that that's what means anything to them anymore. But, you know, it's interesting as you were sharing your baptism story. I had that same experience. My parents. The church wanted me to be baptized. My parents said, no, let's not do that. And as time went on, I am the one who approached them right. about being baptized. Right. And I will say this, you know, when you're, when you're young like that, you give like you're a tadpole, right? And a tadpole has a head and a tail <laughs> and lives in the water. Hmm. And you give that. I have that... no idea. I have no idea where you're going. <laughs> yeah, where you're are going. you yeah, going? I'm curious. <laughs> I'm liking so it. So let's just, just go with this. Go with this. Right? I but can... you, you give yourself your tadpole self <laughs> to the Lord. But it's, then not, you get... it's not getting better. Okay. <laughs> no, it is. He's going to go to okay. me. But then you get the legs and you yeah. get the ability to go in and out of the water and all these other environments. And it's almost like you then have to say, okay, I give all of this to you as well, Lord. Mm -hmm. Right? Like I, I dedicate this to you as well. And I think that for me was kind of the progression of giving my four-year-old self to the Lord and then at a later time giving the rest of that to the Lord as a completion, but not a... You know, that's, that's, that's what I'm talking about. I, I don't think it made the book, though. I think David probably that. took that out. <laughs> the Deadpool well, that's going yeah. to be the sequel, well, Faith me, for, faith for Tadpoles. For <laughs> yeah. let, let, me give, let me give you an example <laughs> of how differently these resilience and habituals are experiencing Jesus, just by the numbers. Okay. okay. And remember, each one of these numbers represents a life that God loves. So it's really important that we understand that. Mm. But when we talk about those resilience Okay, so we asked them, I believe living in relationship with Jesus is the only way to find fulfillment in life. 90% of resilience said, that's true for me. 
only 49% of habitual said mm. that was true for them wow. and 21% of nomads. So you see kind of the difference in terms of their experience of Jesus. My relationship with Jesus brings me deep joy and satisfaction. 90% of resilience, uh, 48% of habitual. So half, this isn't like resilience or 7% more in almost every situation. It's double digit percentage points differences between resilience experience and the habituals experience. You talked about meaningful relationships being key, and we're probably not going to be able to dive into all five of these, and this is where people can get your book, Faith for Exiles, Correct. and look deeply at this. But I remember when my kids were growing up, I used to say to them, I want you to identify somebody who is five to 10 years older than you, who you would look at and say, I would like my life to look like their life when I'm their age, and then figure out how they got to where they are. I was conscious of the fact that they needed some modeling and they needed some people who cared about them beyond mom and me, people who they could point to and say, yeah, this is this is what I'm growing for. When we're talking about meaningful relationships, role modeling is a part of that, isn't it? It's a huge part of it. And I think one of the most practical things that moms and dads can do out of this, because you can't make your kids connect to Jesus. You know, you can provide an environment for that. But the one thing you can do is invite other men and women into your home and surround your kids with these great examples and relationships. And one of the things that we found by, once again, wide margins is that resilience had much stronger relationships. Mm -hmm. They had people that were adults in their life that they felt were investing in them. They had people that they felt they could be honest with about their spiritual journey. They had people that they admired in their church that they wanted to be like, just like what you suggested. And by almost 40 to 50 percentage points difference between the habituals in most situations. So huge difference relationally. So when I hear pastors say, hey, our church is all about relationships. I'm like, mm. show me how you're really connecting those younger people to those older people. That's something that moms and dads do. And, you know, we don't invite people over to our homes anymore. We don't have those things. And that's where I really got to know the men and women in our church. And they invested in me mm -hmm. and helped me think about my life spiritually. Even when some of them went off the rails, I saw the grace of God in their lives. And I think that's a really important thing that we can't discount. Invite somebody over to your house this week, a mature believer into your house this week. That'll be a first step in helping your children. And you'll notice in this generation, a lot of skepticism about uh, people that are paid to do something or even about the motivations of their parents. Uh, we actually see some really interesting social data now where young people are more likely to show trust and affinity with other, with their peers or with people online. In fact, they trust a YouTube channel more than they would trust their youth pastor. And so um, part of what I think we're talking about in terms of meaningful relationships, and, and Bob, I think that was such a great decision. We've tried to do that now in the lives of our kids based on this data. Uh, is how important it is for us to put others in the lives of our kids who don't have the same mixed motives about how Christian my kids turn out, right? So like young people now are like, yeah, of course you're my parent. Of course you expect me to be a Christian because you're Christian, but that's because, you know, it makes you look good or because, you know, you, you like they sometimes push us in the right ways about our own idols, don't they? That we yeah. as parents may want our kids to be Christian, not just because it's the best thing for them, but because it reflects on us and we don't want to be sh ashamed by that. And so um, having other people around us um, and around the, our kids who can help them understand what it means to follow Christ, who love them, who love Jesus as much as we do, who don't have the same sort of you know, weird motivations, perhaps about getting them to be a Christian, uh, actually helps to cut through that clutter. Mm -hmm. You know, as I think about my three sons now married and grandkids, their faith that I think I'd put them in the resilient. It's as much because of Dave and Ann as it is Rob, Frank, Ryan, John, Craig, and Dave. Those men poured into the, or them in high school, and now, even now, as they're in their 30s, they're still pouring into them, and they found that. That is, you guys said it, it's so critical that somebody else, and some of these guys were my age, so it isn't just that they're cool and hip in their age, it's that, no, they're living it in front of them, they're pouring into them and mentoring them. It, you can't devalue that. It is, that is critical. It's interesting when we look at, like, 
younger stories like on Nickelodeon or the Disney or whatever, almost always the parent or one parent is absent. Mm. And the writer of Hannah Montana in an interview was talking about the fact that the reason they do this is because it creates more tension for character to develop mm. in the story, not having those parents present or in the storyline. And I thought about that because almost all of our hero stories, uh, they're orphans, right? Um, Hmm. Superman, parents died on Krypton. He was adopted. (laughs) Harry Potter, adopted. Everybody, right? So, I mean, you start looking at it and, you know, Peter Parker and Spider-Man, Batman, parents killed when he's a kid. You start going, whoa, this is weird. Why is this? It's a part of the storytelling narrative. And when our kids are going through that formational years, we are symbolically dead <laughs> as parents, right? And That's this is depressing. You know, <laughs> yeah. We may be speaking truth into their life. I mean, I was, you know, I was kind of called the teen whisper at church, and uh, people be like, "Oh, you're going to have an easy time with your kids," and I'm like, "But I'm the parent of my kids. Yeah. I'm the whisper to your kids." <laughs> and so there's kind of a different role that's played there. And mm. so I realized as we went through that phase, I needed the men and women of the church church to be there, to be those people speaking into their life when the truth that I was speaking into, they weren't hearing it. I was symbolically dead to them. I think there's something about that. How lucky are we that uh, our kids have us as parents uh, because we have all the answers. <laughs> yes. Uh, we have the PowerPoint slides and the research to prove how they should be raised. And, and this, go, this goes back, David, to where we started, which is there is no formula. There is no formula. No. The salvation of, of a child is a work of God in that child's life. And Get there's, on your knees and pray. Th- there is nothing you can do to make your child a Christian. That's, and there is no timeline for it. And I think right. that's the important thing is we need to be patient and allow God to work mm-hmm. in their lives and just cultivate that soil for them, but not expect. And we don't want our kids to go through pain. We really don't because we've gone through it, and yet sometimes pain is the thing that has drawn us to Jesus. Yeah, but we're telling a lot of parents of prodigals and nomads, uh, their story's not over yet. Not over. Mm. It's not. And, That's why we call them prodigals. And you keep praying, and you keep seeking the Lord about what your interaction with them looks like. And you pray for God to bring somebody into their life who's going to be revolutionary to help point them to the truth. I just hope— moms and dads will will catch a vision for what you've outlined in this book. Because again, while it's not a recipe, uh, it is a roadmap for the things we can do to help stack the deck. And that's to point our kids to an authentic relationship with Jesus, to meaningful relationships with others, to understand you're going to face cultural headwinds. And here's what it looks like to live counterculturally in the midst of a culture that's going in a different direction. Here's what it looks like for your work to be meaningful as you live it out. And here's what it looks like to be on mission and to have uh, God's purposes at the center of of your life. And, And Get the book. I, we're, we're, it's going to mm-hmm. change. We're excited about the work you guys have done and uh, want to share this book with our listeners. Thank you guys for being on Family Life today. And, and David, thanks for joining us remotely here. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. David and Mark's book is called Faith for Exiles, and you can order your copy online at familylifetoday.com or call 1-800-FL-TODAY to get a copy of the book. Again, the title is Faith for Exiles, Five Ways for a New Generation to Follow Jesus in Digital Babylon by David Kinneman and Mark Matlock. Order from us at familylifetoday.com or call to order 1-800-358-6329. That's 1-800-F as in family, L as in life, and then the word today. Now, I don't know how many of you who are listening to us today are listening on your local radio station. We are thrilled to be in partnership with hundreds of stations all across the country. But there's a growing number of you who are listening to Family Life Today as a podcast, listening on the Family Life Today mobile app. So uh, we hope you'll download the app and join us more often here on Family Life Today. And we hope you can be back with us again tomorrow when we're going to talk about what we should do when our emotions are 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 peaking they're at a 10 whether it's fear or anger or sadness whatever it is we're feeling how do we process that as followers of christ courtney reisick is going to join us to talk about that we hope you can join us as well on behalf of our hosts david ann wilson i'm bob lapine 
We'll see you back next time for another edition of Family Life Today. Family Life Today is a production of Family Life, a crew ministry, helping you pursue the relationships that matter most. The preceding program was from the Family Life Today Classic Archives.